Good morning, my name is Lee Nish. I'm pastor of Sparks United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. This is the third in a series of four messages on taking the pledge seriously. We're taking a look at the pledge all during the month of July and trying to uh, make some connection between what Paul has to say about the church and the state in chapter 13 of Romans and how he leads up to that in terms of how we become good disciples in Romans. So we're going to be exploring more of that today. I want to just start off with this one remark. Um, you know, a lot of times people ask me, what is the will of God for my life? Sometimes they have to make choices between this or that, doing something or not doing something. I'm going to tell you today, if you stay tuned, you will know what the will of God is for your life. Now, let's listen to the story of the nations. Today's scripture reading is Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never arrange yourself, avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals upon their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm Alexis and I'll be reading from Romans today. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for, you, for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is a servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Welcome as we continue our series of messages on taking the pledge seriously. Now, there are actually two aspirational uh, statements that we're familiar with. One is the Lord's Prayer that many of us say at least weekly, if not daily. It's part of our devotion. But another is something that we learned 
probably in school, and some of us only say anymore when we're at a ball game, and that's the Pledge of Allegiance. What I'd like to suggest to you during this series of messages is that both of these statements are aspirational and that part of what our duty is not only as a disciple of Jesus Christ, but also a citizen in a constitutional democracy is to lean into both of those statements, to embody those statements in our choices, in what we do, what we say, uh, really uh, how we live our lives. And so uh, this week, we're going to take a look at another set of uh, uh, commendations that Paul leaves us at the end of chapter 12 in how we might do that. And we're going to entitle this message, Simply Doing Good. Oh, by the way, that's exactly what God's will is for your life. Do good. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, come on, really? Well, I do that all the time. Well, maybe you do, but maybe you could do good better. And so I'm going to share with you today what I would call uh, seven habits of highly effective disciples. And these habits are all suggested by Paul towards the end of chapter 12 in Romans on how to do good. And so let's begin with habit number one. Habit number one, be a blessing even as you bless others. Now, I lived in the South for almost five years, the city of Atlanta, and so I learned to speak Southern. There are a whole bunch of phrases in Southern that uh, I could share with you, but I'm only going to share one today. One of those phrases is this. You can say anything about anyone as long as you conclude whatever you're going to say with this phrase, bless their hearts. Now, usually what you say prior to bless their hearts is not that flattering. But what I'm suggesting to you in this is that to be a blessing to others, you actually bless others and not bless others because they blessed you. In fact, the first habit of highly effective disciples is to bless others who you would not normally bless. As Paul would say, bless those who persecute you. And how does that look? Well, if your enemies are hungry, how do you bless your enemies? You feed them. If your enemies are thirsty, how do you bless your enemies? You give them something to drink. And then Paul goes on to say, for doing this, you'll heap burning coals on their heads. Now, that doesn't sound like a blessing, except it becomes a blessing as those burning coals become the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon them. And they are all of a sudden beginning to waken to God's blessing and the way that works in their lives. And so the first habit of highly effective disciples is to be a blessing and to bless others. The second habit of highly effective disciples is to live in harmony with one another. How do you live in harmony with one another? Well, you might say, it's easy, just agree with one another. But I know what happens. The day will not be done until you come into disagreement with somebody. And so it's easy to live in harmony with people who you, dis who you agree with. It's not so easy to live in harmony with those with whom you disagree. And that's really what Paul is saying here. Live in harmony with those with whom you disagree. I want to share with you a, a quote from Benjamin Franklin, which continues to inspire this nation as we lean into the Pledge of Allegiance. It inspires me, and I hope it will inspire you when it comes to living in harmony with people with whom you disagree. Benjamin Franklin said this shortly after um, finishing the work on the Constitution. He says, Thus I consent, sir, to this Constitution because I expect no better and because I'm not sure that it is not the best. The opinions I have had of its errors I sacrifice to the public good. I have never whispered a syllable of them abroad. Within these walls they were born, and here 
they shall die. If every one of us in returning to our constituents were to report the objections he has had to it and endeavor to gain partisans in support of them, we might prevent it being generally received and thereby lose all the salutary efforts and great advantages resulting naturally in our favor among foreign nations as well as among ourselves from our real or apparent unanimity. In short, what he is really saying is simply this. Although there are areas where we disagree, our common purpose is much more important and compelling than our disagreements. And so for the sake of our common purpose, we go forward in unity and in harmony, even in the midst of our disagreements. Let me ask this, friends. Can we do this? Could we do this as we engage in conversations about local issues over which we may have disagreements, but could we go forward in harmony, acknowledging our disagreements, but keeping in mind the greater purpose? This, my friends, is what I believe Paul is saying to be the second highly effect, the second element of, of highly effective disciples, second habit. Let's go on to the third. Paul says, associate with the lowly. I want to ask you something. Do you have friends in low places? That was a country song, in case you didn't remember. Now, I don't mean embarrassingly low places. What I mean is low places in terms of humility, low places in terms of stature or status. You know, one of the things that I'm afraid is, um, is corrupting much of our civic life is the amount of money that it takes to campaign and to win elections. And sometimes it tempts us to look to those areas of concentrated wealth and to give them maybe a little more voice than what we might give those of no wealth. You know, I think of, uh, I think of all the ways that we in the church associate with the lowly. And I'm ex extremely uh, impressed with this church. I'm proud of it because of how we serve those uh, who are not the high wealthy, high stat status people. And in our civic discourse, I'm wondering if we could not at least take their plight as seriously as we take the plight of those who are wealthier. This would be, I believe, the third habit of highly effective disciples. The fourth is this. Paul says, take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Now, it's easy to think about what's noble in the sight of some, but not others, or to think of what's noble in sight of others, but not the ones that we're not necessarily fond of. But what does it mean to take sight of what is noble, to take seriously and take thought for what is noble in the sight of all? What that really means is what virtues, what values could we all agree upon? And I think many of us would say, you know, there are more there than what we might imagine if we simply take the time to engage in conversation and discover what they are. So that would be the fifth of the seven habits. Let's take a look at the next habit. Paul says it like this. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, I want to make sure you understand what Paul is saying. This is a virtue. This is doing good. But it's not necessarily living in peace. We may never come to a point where we are actually living in peace with one another. But insofar as it is possible for you, live peaceably with one another. Do you see the difference there? We're not called to bury conflict just in order that we maintain uh, a, a lack of battle and war with each other. What we're actually asked to do is to once again take our disagreements, but not allow that to be a reason for not living peaceably with one another. And so this becomes the sixth of the seven habits. And finally, we come to the final habit of highly effective disciples. 
Paul says it this way. Paul says, overcome evil with as much weaponry as you possibly can muster. Do you really think Paul said that? Paul didn't say that. What Paul said was, overcome evil with good. It's not necessary to overcome evil with armaments. It's not necessary to speak from the Old Testament wisdom of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. As we said last week, all that does is bring a society about where we're all toothless and blind. No. We overcome evil only by doing good. Because evil begets more evil. Sin begets more sin. The only way we can stop evil is to break away from it and not respond to doing evil by evil, but respond only, only by doing good. Paul thought it was very important that we learn how to do good, and he's given us these seven habits of highly effective disciples in order for us to practice. And at the end of the day, that really is God's will for our lives. I don't think God really takes a position on which model of car you buy. I don't think God takes a position on what neighborhood you live in. I don't even think God takes a position on the crowd you hang out with. I kind of believe that if my parents saw me hanging out with the crowd that Jesus hung out with, my parents would have an issue with that. No. God has one issue for human beings. And that issue, in just a few words, is to do good. God's will for our lives is to do good. And so I hope when we take the pledge that we take it seriously. We focus on those lines halfway through the pledge where we rehearse this phrase, uh, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. But by intentionally engaging in acts of doing good, we continue down the road toward that aspirational hope. Just as when we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we ask of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? We're not there yet. But does that mean we should just forget about it? Each day we make choices and take actions that give us the opportunity to begin to live into those words to practice God's kingdom as if it were in our midst. And as we practice it, it happens, and we find ourselves doing good. I hope both in your personal life this week, as well as in your civic life, you will find new ways, you will find new inspiration to be able to do good in all of your interactions with those who you love, those who are unlovable, but who nevertheless are in our same vehicle, heading in the same direction, with whom we have to figure out how to live peaceably together. God's blessings upon this road that we're on together. Amen. Hey, everybody. This is Lisa Wilson reporting here from our beautiful home. Some of you may know me as Cindy Sabatini's daughter. If you don't know me, hey there. Uh, I work on cruise ships as a singer the majority of the year and the pandemic has really brought all of my work to a standstill. And so what I've tried to do is reflect on what I appreciate most about working on cruise ships. And one of the things that I really appreciate is the opportunity to work with a lot of different cultures. On one ship, we may have employees and guests from over 60 different countries. And something that that's taught me over the years is that everyone, no matter where they come from, is do respect, 
has cultures and beliefs and opinions that are valid and that I am only going to learn more about the human race by becoming friends, co-workers, and just general confidants with people from all over the world. And the more that I open myself up to learn about their cultures and where they come from and what they believe, the more that I learn myself. So what I would encourage everyone to do uh, moving forward in order to do better for ourselves and for this planet, I think just meet new people, learn about them, learn about where they come from, ask them questions and just do better, no more know more about the people that inhabit this beautiful planet of ours because we're more alike than we know and in the ways that we're different it's incredible and we should really embrace that so i encourage you all to do better go out there and just meet new people love to you all stay safe stay healthy My name is Cindy, and I'll be leading us in prayer today. And I'd like to share with you a chorus to a song that um, can help us enter into prayer today. And it's, take my life and let it be a living prayer, my God, to thee. 
Will you pray with me? God who plants seeds of hope and justice within our lives, we are so grateful for this community of faith and for all and anywhere. We pray for those who are hunger or thirst for your healing and reconciling word. You know all the things that are on our hearts today and you bring us together in love and support. We ask your healing mercies with those who struggle with illness of every kind, with those feeling lost or marginalized, for those who mourn and for whom the darkness of sorrow enshrouds them. We ask your growth producing love for all those who celebrate and rejoice today. Be with each of one of us and all of those whom we have named in our hearts before you. Help us to reach out to each other in compassion and support. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us this week. We're glad that uh, you're, you're joining us. And there are just a couple things I want to say in conclusion. Number one is thank you for your generosity. So many of you can continue to give regularly, which makes all the difference in the impact that this congregation is able to have not only across our community, but around the world. And others of you are donating for the first time. Thank you so much for considering to place your trust in us to continue to use your resources as God's resource uh, in the coming weeks and months. Also, I want to remind you that there are still opportunities available for you to serve uh, through our food pantry, through our farmer's market, uh, through a variety of ways that uh, just call the office and we will be happy to, to uh, bring you in contact with those service opportunities. Even in the midst of COVID-19, we serve safely and we serve effectively. And I'd like to remind you of a special opportunity that comes along every Sunday morning at 9.30. It's our Zoom fellowship, and we'd love to have you join us. Uh, it's a time when we get a chance to uh, hold fellowship with others in the congregation to uh, kind of catch up on our lives together and also to have a time of prayer. We'd love for you to join us there. And then at 10 o'clock, we transition into our conversation on racism in America. It's a guided conversation that all of those who are a part of it are being blessed. We'd love to have you join us as well. It's on the same Zoom link as our fellowship hour is. So join us at 9.30 for the fellowship hour or at 10 o'clock. In the meantime, I wish you a blessing, be safe, and continue to look for opportunities to do good. Amen. Comfort for all.